first industry. Before that, we had covered what the causes of the Industrial Revolution were. Today, we're going to start again by trying to figure out what the world's first industry was. Again, a couple of reminders before we get started. Make sure you've got your note taker out and ready to go. Again, you can be printing it uh, as you're working. You can print it out and type on it, or you can print it out and write on it, or you can be typing on it as we're working. You can email it to me, or you can bring it in. Remember, only notes that have been initialed will be available to use on your test next Friday, which means you have to turn them in by Friday of this week. All right, let's get started. The first industry of the Industrial Revolution was the textile industry. The term textile is going to be on the test. The uh, definition for it is right there for you. Any type of cloth or woven fabric. Your think about it, your very first think about it, which is again on your Cornell note taker, is what kinds of things are made from woven cloth or fabric. I can't make any promises for Mr. White's class, but for Mr. k -Dub's class, if you have the longest list in your class period for things that are made from fabric, I will give you a dum-dum. Next slide. We're going to look at two videos that are going to kind of talk about how factories got built and how they were used to replace the cottage system and the putting out system. Those are two names for styles of having clothing made or systems for having clothing made before the Industrial Revolution. So let's go ahead and get to our first video. Textile manufacturing was the first major industry to undergo industrialization. And for many people, the change was tragic. That was because before the Industrial Revolution, the poor rural population had few ways of earning a living, except for the unreliable income they got from farming. But in Europe especially, many rural people could add to their incomes by working at what were known as domestic or cottage industries by making cloth. The way this worked was that cloth merchants purchased large quantities of wool from sheep farmers, as well as linen fibers from flax farmers. The merchants then delivered the material to cottage workers to be made into cloth. First, the fibers were spun into yarn using a simple foot-powered machine called a spinning wheel. Then, under what was known as the putting out system, the yarn was then distributed to weavers to be woven into certain types of cloth on a hand loom. It took a long time, but after the roll of cloth was finished, the merchants paid the cottage workers for what they had done. These traditional home-based textile workers were the first people to be replaced by machines when the Industrial Revolution began. Right, so there she's talking about really more the negative consequences of the textile industry uh, becoming uh, industrialized. But what you have to remember is some words that she didn't really want to emphasize there. Super slow, takes a long time, and they're not making a whole lot of stuff in the first place. So big change, that's what I want you to focus on, is that we're getting more product and we're getting it quicker. Uh, we're going to look at how this actually took place soon as I can get the Prezi to work. There we go. So this video is going to actually talk about what the textile industry was like during the Industrial Revolution and how it looked in the factories. So here you go. When the Industrial Revolution began in England, the earliest textile factories employed many young children and paid them almost nothing. But that changed in America because by the mid-1800s, eight out of every ten workers in the textile factories were unmarried women between the ages of 15 and 30. Most of them had left behind quiet lives on isolated farms for the adventure of working in a city and earning a steady wage. The conditions were not good in the textile factories, but they did improve over time. The machines tended to be extremely loud and dangerous to operate. The hours were long. The work was quite monotonous and the air in the factories was filled with tiny bits of fiber that damaged the workers lungs. Just pause real quick here, the reason I'm doing this, we're reading the apostate, here's what Johnny's been going through working in a textile factory. Just be thinking about that, there's some connections to be made here between the reading 
in the video that you're watching. If you want to go back and look at it again, feel free to do that. The wages were low as well. The mill girls, as they were called, earned less than $3 for putting in a six-day, 60-hour work week, while men got a dollar more a week for doing the same jobs. The lives of the mill girls were almost completely controlled by the factories where they worked. For example, right across the street from this textile factory are the company-owned boarding houses where they slept and ate their meals. Here, the girls were carefully supervised and followed a strict curfew, but they were provided with respectable surroundings that were often more comfortable than those they had known back on the farm. However, as the 19th century rolled on, unskilled factory jobs began to be filled more and more often by recent immigrants to America instead of farm girls. Such jobs provided many immigrant families with a reliable income with which to start their new lives. So she kind of emphasizes the negatives again. I feel like with the apostate and some of the other things we've talked about with Food Inc., we've kind of been trashing on industrialism a little bit here. And don't get me wrong, we'll continue to do that. But let's, let's take a look at some of the positives. We're getting more products. They're coming out faster. They're being made cheaper. Women who would have been stuck on a farm and been kind of been under the, the, uh, the heel of their family had an opportunity to get away from that and, and live somewhere that they never would have had the opportunity to live otherwise. Not to mention the fact that having your own job gives you a level of freedom that women hadn't had before. And then on top of that, she talks about the immigrants. Really important to know, yes, those immigrant workers are being taken advantage of. They're treated terribly. But it does give them the opportunity to move to a new country where they don't speak the language, get a job, and have an opportunity to give their children the chance to have a better life. And that's a really, really, really big uh, positive from the Industrial Revolution is that people have a chance to make their lives better sometimes. All right, next question. Why did the Industrial Revolution start in Britain, of all places, such a tiny little island? It would seem so unimportant. But it had a lot of advantages going for it. Number one, it had a lot of good natural resources. It had seaports. That means that they could get their, uh, their product out to the rest of the world with their ships really easily. We don't have it listed here, but the fact that they had the strongest navy in the world for almost 250 years also meant that they could make sure that those ships weren't attacked. Huge important thing. Other things that Britain had that others did not have or didn't know they had to use, they had coal which could be used to make the machines work. You saw the, the harnessing energy slide on the last screencast, so coal is important. Iron is important because it makes the machines, it also makes products that the machines make. And then rivers are hugely important, not just at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but rivers are really important still today. That source of running water can be used as a source of energy. It can be used to clean things out. It's got a lot of important uh, factors having that fresh water source nearby. Your next think about it, hit pause when you're ready. What natural resources does Washington State have a lot of? Again, for KW students, the longest list in your class period will get a dum-dum. The next resource that we have in Britain in great abundance is something called capital. This is not the capital, you know, the main city of a place that is spelt with an O. This capital, spelt with an A, is having resources to invest in a business or to get a business started. That's one of your terms for the test, so make sure you've got a good definition for it there in your keywords. But again, the basic understanding is you've got money to get a business started. It means you can buy all the machines, buy the factory, pay the workers, right? Starting a business costs a lot of money. You need some capital to do that. Or you need to know somebody with some capital to do that. The other thing that the, uh, the British had in abundance was something called an entrepreneur. This is a French word. It's basically someone who is able to take an idea and turn it into something that's profitable. Oftentimes, entrepreneurs don't invent anything. They don't have the new idea. They're not the first to do something. They just figure out a way to make money off of it. Lots of times, entrepreneurs actually end up losing money because they, they try these things all the time. They're very experimental. They will often tell you, if you talk to an entrepreneur, that for every one business that's gone well, they've had 10 that have completely gone just terribly wrong. And so 
it's important to have these people who are willing to take these risks. These people do generally end up making a pretty good amount of money. Your think about it here is who do you know that might be an entrepreneur? Just one thing I'll tell you from something I read recently, an over, not an overwhelming, a large number of people who are successful entrepreneurs in the US in the last 50 years or so or so were actually dyslexic. Don't know why that is, but that might change your perception of who some of these people might be. It's been proven that some of the things that dyslexic people go through early in life sets them up to be successful entrepreneurs. So what were the effects of Industrial Revolution? Well, the first one, whoop, hit the wrong button. There we go. The first one is one that we've already talked about, urbanization. Again, the movement of people from rural areas to cities or from farms to factories might be another way of thinking of it. Urbanization, if you don't already have a good definition for it, make sure you write it down. It will be on the test. There's another effect. This one is laissez-faire. It is a position of the government that they are not going to do anything to restrict or slow down business. There's not going to be any regulations, which is supposedly supposed to allow uh, business owners to make the most possible amount of money. While this might technically be true in the short term, oftentimes it has a problem of meaning that the boss uh, makes money and doesn't worry about the safety or the well-being of his workers, which in the long run ends up hurting the business. Number two, factories become unsafe and unhealthy as a result of these people maximizing profits with no concern for their workers. So we've seen this again, connection to the apostate. We've got these factories being massively unsafe and unhealthy. Workers are constantly mistreated and fired for being sick for too long or things like this. So it's not a great thing, this, on, this laissez-faire spirit. We've got one more slide on laissez-faire. There it is. The other problem with laissez-faire that gets developed is that wealthy business owners start to realize that one way for them to make more money is to own all their competitors. In other words, to be the only person who is selling you coffee or who's selling you chairs or whatever the product is that they're making. So that think about it there is what might some of the re results be if a company was the only place where you could buy a specific product. So think about this. If Starbucks was the only place you could go to buy coffee, how much do you think they could get away with charging you for coffee? Go ahead and write down your response. I'm going to move on. You can hit pause if you need to. Economic effect. Really important, we get labor unions as a result of the workers being treated like crap by their bosses. We end up with labor unions. Basically, the idea behind a labor union is as a single worker against a wealthy boss, you have no power. But if everybody in the factory unites together and fights the boss, then they have some power. Better yet, if everybody everywhere who works in factories unites against the bosses, then the bosses have to give you something in return. Right? You can go on strike and then they, their factories aren't working and that's the leverage that the workers have. It's through their numbers. So they're able to force people to give them things or they're able to force their bosses to give them things by having the numbers. Okay, So labor union, another word that you're going to need to know for the test and your next think about it here is what are three or more rights that might have been won by labor unions? Mr. White has tried to give you the hint of the eight hour work day. I'll go even further. Think of anything that's good that workers have probably because of labor unions. There's your hint. Come up with a list. K-Dubs classes, dumb dumb for the longest list. That's accurate. There are also some political effects to industrialism. One of the dominant ones that we don't hear about anymore, but that was really important uh, way back in the day, which was a Wednesday, in case you were wondering, was utilitarianism. Utilitarianism has a lot of philosophers. There's a lot of uh, in-depth thinking on it. But the easiest way to think of, of it is the greatest good for the greatest number. In other words, the government will do its best to help the most amount of people that are suffering the most. But if you're only suffering a little bit and there aren't very many of you, government doesn't really care. So utilitarianism, 
comes from the idea that you're going to do the most good for the most amount of people possible. Okay, that's how that one works. Also a term from the test, so make sure you've got that definition written down in your note taker. Perhaps the most important and longest lasting political effect of industrialism is the rise of a political idea known as socialism, also often confused with communism. These two things are different. Uh, we've touched on communism in our revolutions unit. We're touching on it here. We will go in depth on it during our political or our economics unit in a, in a few months here. Socialism, however, let's just make sure we know what it means, is the idea that rather than the boss or the owner making all of the money and getting all the benefits of the factory, it should be the people who work in the factory that get all the benefits and get all the money and they split it up, they split it up amongst themselves evenly. So basically, socialism can be defined as everybody splitting up the profits for all the work that everybody's doing. Okay, it might be a pie in the sky idea, but it's a pretty nice pie in the sky idea. The most famous socialist is Karl Moak. Wow. Karl Marx, he's famous for writing the Communist Manifesto. He did that in 1848. He basically came up with this idea that once the working class and the factory workers got sick of being taken advantage of, they would eventually rise up and violently overthrow the factory owners for various reasons. This really never happened in any of the places that he thought it would. Again, we'll cover that more in depth during our economics unit. Moving on to the next slide, and yes, socialism is in the test. Moving on to the next slide is the proletariat. Proletariat, the direct definition is the working class. These are the people who work low income physical labor jobs. These people still exist today. They're harder to see sometimes, but it's basically the low wage workers who are using their bodies rather than their minds to make money. That's who the proletariat is. That's who Karl Marx thought would take over the countries uh, where industrialism had taken root. Make sure you've got it in your notes. It's on the test. We also get not the creation, but the rise and the expansion of the middle class, or what the French call the bourgeoisie. Okay? Basically what this is, this is people who still have to work for a living. These aren't factory owners. These aren't people with wealth whose kids are never going to have to work a day in their lives. But these are people whose jobs are a little bit easier. They're, really, uh, they're more uh, brain-oriented jobs. There are people who have higher levels of education and whose jobs have some uh, honor or prestige attached to them. So like doctors and lawyers and small business owners, right? People like that are part of the middle class. Your last think about it, I think, is Bothell, is the question, is Bothell mostly bourgeoisie, proletariat, or is it both? Answer that question while you hit pause. I'll move on to the next slide. All right. Lastly, the social effects. This one seems pretty obvious to us now, but clocks weren't very important. We hit on it a little bit in the last lecture, but clocks become important as a result of the factory. The factory meant that people had to be someplace at a certain time and they had to get certain things done before the next time or timer went off. Life is no longer, is no longer about seasons and daylight. It's about the clock. So I apologize. You've actually got one other think about it here. Can you list five or more events in your day that require you to be someplace at some specific time? You may use one example from school. Hint, hint, wink, wink. All right, hit pause. We'll move on. Finish you off here with a video. The video is really great. It's by Charlie Chaplin. Uh, I know he's got a Hitler stash, but uh, he had the Hitler stash before Hitler did, so we should really call this a Charlie Chaplin stash. Uh, he's a famous British comedian. He did silent movies where he, di he didn't talk. There was still noise. So we'll watch the movie, give you an idea of the importance of the clock, and then we'll stop, and that is the lecture for the day. But there is notes required for modern times, so make sure you watch the video. Oh, no, maybe not.